most boss fights feel awesome because you, a cool hero, are tasked with pulverising some giant nightmare beast that more often than not is kind of gross. And if it's bloodborne full of extra eyes and teeth for some reason. But what about the games that turn this rule of boss battling on its head by making you fight against yourself? And not only you, but an evil and inarguably cooler version of you. These sinister doppelgangers know all your moves and are often some of the toughest fights in a game, not least because you won't be able to shake the feeling that they're just that little bit more badass than you are. Here are the boss fights against your evil, cooler self. Beware spoilers for the following. Legend of Zelda hero Link knows how to keep his cool in a boss fight, even when things get weird, like if the fight suddenly turns into tennis for some reason. How odd. But even Hyrule's most brave boy would struggle to keep his cool in this highly unsettling boss fight in Ocarina of Time, which takes place in the famously irritating Water Temple just to set the tone. Partway through the dungeon, Link opens a door to find himself in a vast expanse of water, featureless apart from a few rocks and a single dead tree, which seems innocuous unless you're eagle-eyed enough to spot Link's reflection when he runs past it. Yes, congratulations, you have found yourself in the hiding place of Dark Link, an entity you might call a shadowy mirror version of our hero, but that we prefer just to call really f***ing creepy. <laughs> ah! Dark Link is the combat equivalent of Link in every way, but significantly more badass in several key areas. He's chrome-plated like a fantasy Robocop, has glowing red eyes like a Terminator Robocop, and if you try something as foolish as a sword swipe, he'll hop on your sword like a Peter Pan Robocop. He also has a deep booming voice that makes poor Link's battle cries sound awfully shrill and panicky in comparison. <laughs> and can easily turn your best attacks back against you, making him one of the most baffling and difficult foes you'll face in the game. Get here, you red-eyed demon! <laughs> With Dark Link parrying your every move, it's clear that this is to be a battle of wits, and that the only path to victory is to outthink, not overpower, your opponent. After all, you need to show Dark Link that the hero of time is defined by courage, not raw power. But if courage doesn't work, he's also super vulnerable to being hit with a hammer. Hey, being smashed flat with a hammer is also one of my weaknesses. Guess we really are two sides of the same coin, Dark Link. <laughs> Control puts you in the boots of Jesse Faden of the Bureau of Control, a government body tasked with the containment and study of paranatural phenomena, for instance seeing what happens to a colleague if you make them travel into a spooky Victorian mirror. Yet the speech issue has persisted for hours. <laughs> Calm down, agent. Fascinating. Turns out what happens if you make the colleague travel into a spooky Victorian mirror is nothing good. Agents, make a note of it. Still, Jesse is the intrepid sort, so into the mirror dimension we go. Wait, that didn't sound right. Where, uh oh, turns out everything is backwards, including that audio log, helpfully. What? I can't understand you. You need to listen. I saw something in there. There is something inside. You need to lock down the mirror. The agent is correct. There is something inside the mirror. And if you've read the title of this video, you can guess what it is. Meet Mirror World Jesse, or as the game understandably calls her, S Edge. She's like you, but well, we'll let her introduce herself once we reverse that audio you just heard. I'm much wilder than you. Not only is S Edge wilder than you, she's also super dangerous, equal to you in terms of speed and psychokinetic strength. 
and yet you must defeat her in order to cleanse the mirror of its nefarious power. All of the while trying to come to terms with the fact that this wilder version of you is not only your match in combat terms, she also has an undoubtedly much cooler jacket. Much lamer name though, S Edge. Good luck trying to find that novelty keychain. Iconic game hero Lara Croft has many imitators, just ask Nathan Drake or any of the roughly 5,000 Lara Croft cosplayers at any Comic Con. But the worst imitator poor Lara ever had to put up with is undoubtedly the Doppelganger, a recurring villain in the Tomb Raider series and seen here in Tomb Raider Underworld. Created by tech CEO and erstwhile ruler of the lost city of Atlantis, Jacqueline Natler, the doppelganger, as you can see, mirrors Lara in every way, with several kick-ass exceptions. It's faster, more aggressive, has glowing cat eyes, and unlike Lara, wasn't too nervous to finally try out that red hair dye that's been sitting in the bathroom cabinet for months. <laughs> Also, the doppelganger is considerably more chill with the concept of burning down Lara's family home and fatally shooting Lara's friend Alistair, I presume. <laughs> Although the doppelganger shows up throughout the game to kick Lara's butt or murder her friends, you are tragically denied a proper boss fight with this twisted twin. When I made this creature for Amanda, she had no idea that my true purpose was to have the means to destroy you at this very moment. Not so, however, in previous game 2007's Tomb Raider Anniversary, a remake of the very first Tomb Raider in which Lara's doppelganger can also be encountered, albeit with her character less fleshed out. Or should we say more fleshed out because this doppelganger has all of its, uh, flesh out. This freaky evil twin is a perfect mirror image of Lara, exactly imitating all of her jumps and moves, albeit while lacking some key features such as Lara's backpack, twin pistols or skin. The doppelganger won't attack you unless you try to attack it, but can't be killed by conventional means as every attack you try is mirrored, hurting Lara. But there's no situation Lara can't climb, jump and leave a pull her way out of, including a mind-bending fight to the death against her evil skinless self. Manage to arrange the combat arena into the correct configuration and you can end up in a scenario where jumping will send Lara over to another platform, but the mirror image of that action will plunge your clone to a fiery death, leaving Lara alive to try and come to terms with the unimaginable horror of having watched her skinless twin die screaming in lava. I mean, that's got to be a huge psychological burden. Talk about being your own worst enemy. Oh, or not. This doppelganger does live on, however, in the form of an unlockable outfit, so that at any moment you can remember that time you were trapped in a room with a skinless version of yourself. You don't see this at many Comic Cons, I'll tell you that. <laughs> In Kingdoms of Amalur Reckoning, you play as the Fateless One, someone unbound by the threads of fate and thus able to change the world. Oh, and kill things with giant magical weapons. With your fate undecided, only you can choose which of the many possible kinds of hero you become, with abilities drawn from the three schools of might, sorcery and finesse, which is great because who doesn't love having options? But it also comes to bite you in the arse in the final boss fight. When you come up against would-be world-ender Tiernok, you might think that your only problem would be fighting this massive off dragon. However, Tiernok isn't only a massive of dragon, but she also has the ability to conjure creatures which are alternative versions of you. These alternative versions of you are called Splinters of Fate, and represent the various paths not taken as you forged your own destiny as the Fateless One. Did you ever wonder what you might have been if you'd made different life decisions? Well, in Kingdoms of Amala, here are those paths not taken, and they're all awesome and strong and want to kick your butt. You'll face wispy incarnations of you with swords and hammers who invested in might, sorcery-loving alternate selves attacking you with staffs and chakrams, and shadowy dagger-wielding doppelgangers. And they're all so cool! Bit cliquey though, bet they wouldn't let me sit with them at lunch. We 
we've all been there. You think you're done with work and are just heading home when an evil doppelganger forms out of a radioactive superorganism, takes your form and wreaks havoc across the galaxy. Classic Monday. No? Oh, well that's definitely happened to Samus Aran, hero of the Metroid games. Having defeated the Metroid Prime at the end of the appropriately named game Metroid Prime, what should happen but an evil version of Samus creeps out of the wreckage? To begin with, we know very little about this evil Samus, except that she has a hand and an eye where it shouldn't be. Though that said, when you've got a gun for an arm, an eye on your hand probably helps you aim. Dark Samus, for so she is called, becomes a recurring and terrifying boss fight foe for Samus, who's much more accustomed to fighting house-sized alien monsters than a fast and nimble doppelganger, who dare we say it might even have a better gun arm. While you, Samus, can easily be killed by the many dangers in space, Dark Samus proves herself much more resilient. I mean, you'd think this sort of thing happening to you would prove permanently fatal? But wouldn't you know it, Dark Samus just keeps rolling back into your life, like a morph ball made of creepiness. That eerie persistence makes this phazon powered Metroid mutated twin an intimidating foe. Aliens might be terrified of Samus, but if Samus herself is going to be terrified of anything, well, it's probably this. Oh hey, turns out she has no mouth and three eyes. Four, if you count the one on the hand. Cool, cool, cool and normal. Like Samus herself, Dark Samus never says a single word. Despite this, reading the many log entries found throughout the games reveals her to be immensely cruel, capable of brainwashing space pirates and not above jettisoning the survivors of her conquests into the vacuum of space. She's basically you, but unburdened by conscience and with much cooler armor, which is a trade I think we would all seriously consider. Look at you. What makes you so damn special? Why you and not me? If a clone steals your identity, is it really identity theft? Is just one philosophical question that Commander Shepard in Mass Effect 3 does not care to delve into when he or she confronts an evil Shepard clone that's been wreaking havoc in the Citadel DLC. Well, that's creepy. The Cerberus made Clone Shepard has no interest in becoming pals with the space hero with whom they share genetic material. Instead, Clone Shep wants to steal the identity of Shep Classic and has already stolen the Normandy. In fact, Clone Shep is close to making a clear getaway if only the clone's lackeys would hurry up and destroy the sky car preventing them from making the jump to light speed. What the hell's going on up there? Get us out of the nebula and jump to FTL! We can't! A sky car keeps blocking our path! Then shoot it! Considering the clone was bred for spare organs and has only been awake for six months, this genetically identical variant has accomplished a surprising amount. It took you three whole games to get here, regular Shep. What's your excuse? Plus, the clone engages you and your squad in a pitched battle, putting up one hell of a fight despite being outnumbered and very, very cross. You hear me, asshole? I'm Shepard! Like any good clone fight, this one ends with Shepard and the doppelganger locked in unarmed combat, while you're left asking the big questions like, does the clone have an equal claim to Shepard's life, and what if the two of them kissed right now? Hmm, folks, I don't think they're going to kiss. This climactic battle ends with the clone realising they'll never get to be the real Shepard, and that all that awaits them is the lonely life of a clone. Or cloneliness, if you will. Here, take my hand. And then? And then you live. For what? Wow, Shepard. This whole mess sure brings up more of those philosophical questions. Probably best to take some time to reflect Oh, Ha! <laughs> Captain on deck! Or party? That, that works too. It's already started! Dr. Nefarious must be around here somewhere. Are you sure everything's okay, Clank? Maybe Al should take a look at your circuitry. How do you like my special creation, Clank? I call him... Clunk. Your dopey friend seems to be quite fond of him. I'm sure it's not easy building a sentient robot, but if I was Dr. Nefarious from Ratchet and Clank Up Your Arsenal, and was making an identical but evil version of Clank to secretly replace that lovable robot, there are some programming quirks I would definitely want to avoid. 
Join me, and together we will rule an entire galaxy of robots. For one thing, I would want my evil undercover robot Clunk to be a good liar, or at least a better liar than this. Clank, where have you been? I thought something happened to you. I was having my sprockets lubed. Clunk, buddy, the number of times I've tried that line when I showed up late for my job. And it never works. I would also try to program Clunk to match the personality of Clank a bit more closely. For example, I can't recall many instances of the real Clank giggling maniacally having just seen another robot, albeit a villainous one, eliminated. One disposable pop star disposed. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure Goody Two Shoes Sony mascot Clank didn't make a habit of loudly interrupting funerals either. The man was a hero, brave, honest, kind, and humble to the core. <laughs> what a load of bullsh. Captain wow, Clunk, what won't you say? But I suppose the deception is good enough, because having replaced 50% of the playable team that makes up this action platformer, Ratchet ends up carrying the evil version of Clank around for a sizable chunk of the game. At least until the evil Clunk reveals that he is indeed, you know, evil. <laughs> I guess I should be feeling pretty stupid right now. I don't suppose there is any chance he's the evil Clank. <laughs> yeah, didn't think so. At which point you must boss battle the Clank Replicant, which unfortunately possesses some of the same skills as our robot protagonist, pertinently the one where he turns into a giant mech. The showdown with Giant Clunk takes place atop a moving train, which is one of the top five locations you really don't want to be stuck with a bomb-chucking death robot. Managed to wreck up the evil Clank, and Ratchet's reward is to A, feel stupid forever that he didn't figure it out, and B, get the real Clank back. I am sorry, Ratchet. This is all my fault. Or at least, we assume it's the real Clank. I guess what this whole episode has taught us is there's no way to be sure. So those were the times that you had a fight with your evil self who was somehow much cooler than you, which is impossible because I'm sure that you all watching are incredibly cool because you've chosen to watch this video. Um, and that's amazing. If you can think of any other examples, uh, do pop them down in the comments below. But if you can't think of any, don't beat yourself up about it. <laughs> Get it? <coughs> anyway, if you enjoyed the video, please give us a thumbs up and uh, be sure to subscribe because we make more videos like this. We do cool live streams. Uh, we like video games. It's a lot of fun here. See you next time. Bye!